I'd like you to take your Bibles though this evening and turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. And the message is, is I, I think, appropriate for our, our day. And that, and that simply is that, you know, sometimes the right path is not the easiest path. It's not the easiest one to go on. I think all of us could probably give testimony to that. But as we, as we see this election cycle coming into play, uh, sometimes, sometimes, quite frankly, you know, it, it seems that things that things that a lot of times seem to be the right thing sometimes be the most difficult thing that we can do. And as a church and as Christians, we have to keep focused. Believe me, it would be so easy for us to just divorce ourselves from the spiritual needs of America and say, okay, our answers lie in Washington, D.C. Or they, allow, they, they, they lie in Denver, Colorado. Or wherever it might be. Listen, our hope has never been in man. It's always been in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this whole nation, yes, could get turned around uh, if, if, if we had the right kind of leadership. We, we could say, well, a lot of this stuff that's been happening the last almost two years uh, could, could be turned around. Well, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? The problem with all that is that's, uh, that's, the, that's the path to disregard of the spiritual needs of, of this nation. Boy, I mean, even if, even if things did turn around, and, and believe me, I understand Proverbs 29 too. I understand that when the, when the righteous bear rule, the people rejoice. But understand what that verse is saying. It's saying when the righteous are in power, Okay, not, it doesn't say when the conservatives are in power. It, it doesn't say when the Republicans are in power. It says when the righteous are in power. Now I don't know of, and I, I'm not up on this, so I'll admit it right up front. I, I don't know who's born again and running for office. But if they're not born again, they're not righteous. They may be conservative and they may be uh, even Republican and they may be, you know, they, they may, we may believe, uh, you know, secularly speaking, we may believe the same things. But if they're not saved, they're not righteous. God calls the unsaved wicked. Wicked. Now that's, that's where all of us were, so we don't need to get offended by that term because that's where all of us were before we got saved. Sometimes the right path is not the easiest path. It's not the easy one. It's not the easiest to do. I fear what we went through with the last Republican president and, and administration that we had in place. And I, I said it then and I said it since then that I believe the reason why there was such a dramatic turnaround to what we have today is because we pinned all of our hopes on a man. We actually, I think, if we were honest, we'd say we almost worshipped a man and didn't give glory to God. And so God said, well, let's, uh, let's see how this looks the next time around. I don't want to repeat this. I think that just as Brother Diosis has said about a uh, 
the Philippines and the need there and training people. And there's a dearth in America. There are thousands of churches looking for pastors. There are pastors who have totally quit the ministry. There, there's a dearth in the land. Bible colleges that once the biggest, the biggest area of their, of their offering as a Bible college was the ministerial class. Not so anymore. Christian parents are not even desiring their kids for the ministry. I don't even think they pray about it. God, it would be such a blessing if you would, if you would take my kids and use them for your glory in the ministry somewhere. But I don't think it's even being prayed about. Used to be. It used to be. It used to be the desire of Christian parents to see their son or daughter go into full-time, even full-time Christian service for the Lord. There's a dearth in America. There's a huge gap that has taken place. And the truth of the matter is, is that this country is in very serious trouble. Spiritually. And, um, and so we come to, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. I want to begin reading in verse number 1. Just please follow along as I read. And the Bible says, And I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, the saved and the and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Father, please meet with us. Help this preacher. Father, empty me of self. I submit myself to Thee. I need Your power. I need Your filling to preach Your Word. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In verse 7, Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. In the last verse, verse 10, the last of our, our, our passage, he mentions that Demas hath forsaken him. And why? Because Demas was in love with this present world. Never mind the Lord said, love not the world. In other words, love not the the philosophies, the very things that are spoken of that can spoil us, the traditions of men, the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Why? Because it doesn't make any sense to fall into love, fall in love with that which is going to pass away. So I want to mention some things that are easier to do, 
but are not the right thing to do in light of what's happening in America right now, in churches, in, 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 in pastorates, no doubt, no doubt missionaries. First, I want you to see it's easier to quit serving the Lord than to keep serving. It seems, it, it, and, and by the way, there's a lot of that happening. I think that's why, if I can say this, I think that's why a lot of preachers have gotten discouraged. Is because what they see is just a, a falling away of people. Well, Paul predicted, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, he predicted that... Uh, that, that it would happen in verse 3 and 4. That people would just, uh, you can't lose your salvation. It's not talking about losing your salvation. It's talking about getting backslidden. They, they, they will not endure sound doctrine, verse 3 says. But after their lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. If you just turn back, if you just turn back a few pages, look at look at First Timothy chapter four. In verse one it says, First Timothy chapter four and verse one. Now the Spirit speaketh, that's capital S, by the way, the Holy Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, we're in those times, some shall depart from the faith. They, they depart from become, be, being faithful. They used to be faithful. But they're not faithful anymore. They depart from the faith. You can't lose your salvation because God is faithful. And our salvation isn't pinned on performance. It's not pinned on works. We're not saved because we perform well. Some shall depart from the faith, being faithful giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And we see that happening. We see that happening. They leave off being faithful. They, they, they are seduced. By who? Would the Holy Spirit of God lead them to not be faithful? No. So they're seduced by the devil. It's so much easier, isn't it, to just quit. Quit anything. It's easier to quit than to keep going. It's easier to quit serving the Lord. You know, people quit when they're tired. We all get tired. We're human beings. We get tired. That's, 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 the, that's the way it is. But you know, sometimes though we may get tired in the work, listen to me, we should never get tired of the work. Boy, we might get tired doing what we're doing and being involved. Yes. But we should never get tired of the work of God. And I'm thankful that God still desires to want to use me. I'm 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 so thankful that that um, that that I can serve Him. God has promised us that He will strengthen us if we'll wait on Him. You know, I'm reminded. You know, everybody's got its place. Brother Pastor Ben preached a great message on the various different parts of the body. And how every one of those parts is important. And I think about how important it is for people to pray. I think about two little old ladies in London, England who heard about D.L. Moody's uh, revivals in America and they began to pray, God, please bring Moody to, to England. God, please bring this evangelist to England. Sometime later, that actually happened. And, and D.L. Moody came to England and they had revival in England. And I mean, 
Literally, literally, God shook the, the British Empire, the, 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 the United Kingdom. He shook them. What a revival. And it was D.L. Moody who later met those two little old ladies. They were invalids. Both of them in bed. They, they couldn't do much. They, they, couldn't, they never even made it to any of the meetings. But here's what they could do. They could pray. You know, if there's, if there's one thing that us Christians need to do more of, it's praying. And they, they prayed. And Moody said the reason why those meetings were blessed of God like they were was because the prayers of those two little invalid ladies And I believe it's so. They had their part. As as the Lord said of Mary, she hath done what she could. And God doesn't expect you and I to do any more than what we can. And what He'll equip us and what He'll empower us to do. But you know something? (laughs) You know, it's, it's imperative that we that we find where we can serve the Lord and how we can serve the Lord and serve the Lord. But I'll I'll be the first one to admit, it's easy to quit rather than to keep on. It's easy to quit when we're tired. Oh, I think I'll just step back. I was sharing with someone earlier and uh, I said, you know, I needed to have a job when I was in college, when I was studying for the ministry. And I went to prayer and I said, Lord, I I need a job. But I do not want to take one step back from what I'm already doing for you. And so it, it, it came down to, well, um, obviously, I, I, Lord, I can't have a job that, that I'd have to work on Sunday. I'm talking about me. Because I, I need to be in church. And not only that, but good night I was preaching. And I was involved in ministry. But beyond that, I said, you know, Lord, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't take a job that's going to work me on Wednesday. Our, our church up in Montana had... Their midweek service was on Wednesday. I said, Lord, i got to be there on Wednesday. i got teen time. i got, you know, I've got ministry responsibility on Wednesday. Tuesday night was soul winning and visitation. Lord, i got to be out on soul winning and visitation. I can't work Tuesday night. You see how the schedule's getting kind of narrowed down? I was a bus captain. And um, I was one of two bus captains actually on our route because there were some times I wasn't there because I was preaching somewhere. But, but, the, but the thing about it is, Lord, I, I got to be able to go calling on Saturday when I'm here. And I, I, so make a long story short, even the guys that I went to school with said, you know, Randall, you're not even serious about getting a job. Because I can work here, I can't work here. I can't work there, but I can work here. I can work this. I can work in the day here. I can work in the afternoon there. I can't work in the night there. I said, I I don't know. I just trust in God that, that He can provide for us without me having to take one step backwards. And you know what God did? God provided a job. I actually got 40 hours a week in a job that worked all around that schedule. Sleep is overrated. The older I get, the more I rate it. (laughs) But back then, you know, I I, I think I averaged 14 hours a week. 
flee. But you know, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I got to tell you, when you get tired, it's easy to quit. When you feel like quitting, that's when you need to get busy. And God has promised that He'll strengthen us, Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The hardest thing for any Christian to do, especially this Christian, is to have the patience to wait on God. When's God going to answer my prayer on this thing? When's God going to come through on this thing? I, you know, none of us know, do we? But we need to wait on the Lord. It's easy to quit when we're troubled by things. When there's financial problems. When there's family problems. And guess what? Even in a church there can be problems between one Christian or another Christian. It's amazing how many people quit on God, quit on their church family, and, and, and because of one person. Really. But it's easy to quit, isn't it? Just, we can just do it just as quick as I snapped my fingers. Problems can cause a person to want to quit. But again, did the Holy Spirit of God make you want to quit? No. Where'd those thoughts come from? Listen, the thoughts that come into this cranium here, they only, they only come by the source of two spirits. Either the Holy Spirit or a demonic spirit. And that's it. And so all I have to do is ask myself with the thought that I'm having, did the Holy Spirit of God put that thought in my mind? Because if it's not the Holy Spirit, then I already know what spirit it is. And I need to cast that down. The Holy Spirit of God's never told me to quit. But problems can do that. I've seen believers who have gotten discouraged and have given up. And that's not what the Holy Spirit of God wants them to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. When Paul was writing to the Corinthian believers, he said, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. So yeah, troubles come, troubles go. But we need to stay focused on... Listen... When, when, when you're entertaining the thought of quitting, you need to stop and you need to ask yourself, but who am I serving? Who am I serving? And if it's the Lord, then why would I ever quit on the Lord? Why? Did He quit on me? It's easy to quit when everything, by the way, when everything is good. It's easy to quit when everything is good. Romans chapter 11, verse 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell, severity. But toward thee, goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. We need to continually thank God. We need to continually praise God. And when everything is going great, even more so we should be praising God and thanking God. And But you know, some people get distracted by blessings in their life, believe it or not, and, and they quit Suddenly they, they somehow get to the place in their mind, I guess, where they feel like, well, I, 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 I don't really need God right now. They treat God like a genie in the bottle. You know? Stay in the bottle until I need you. And when I need you, I'll rub the bottle and you can come out and rescue me. 
Otherwise, <laughs> I don't really need you. Don't really need you. And, uh, and, and some get too busy. I, I remember a family in my home church And he was, he was active in the bus ministry as well, as his wife also. And uh, they worked in children's ministry. And then a relative died. One of his relatives died. And I, I later learned, because I wondered, what in the world happened to them? And I, I found out that one of his relatives died and left him two million dollars. Now, boy, two million dollars, wow. I mean, used for the glory of God and used for the provision of your family and used for whatever. I mean, that, that could be a real blessing, couldn't it? Something to really praise God for. Something to really uh, thank God for. But instead, what it did was it knocked them right out of the ministry. Next thing, next thing I heard, it's we got a cabin on the lake, bought a boat, got a camper. Gone on the God, gone every weekend. Quit my job. I don't need it anymore. I'm a millionaire. And the last thing that I heard was they were getting a divorce. How sad. How sad. Why, the, the, the goodness of God, the blessings of that, oh my, how God could have been glorified in all of that. After all, they could ask the question, how much money do we really need to live on? Why, we could support missions, we could, we could support church ministries, we could support... I mean, how much money do you actually have to live on? Well, they decided they had to have it all. And it destroyed them. Oh, they'll be in heaven one day. And I don't know what's happened, it's been a lot of years. But when everything went good, it was just all of a sudden easy for him to quit. This poem, this poem pretty much tells it. When things go wrong as they sometimes will, when the road you're crossing seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and you try to smile but you have to sigh, when cares are pressing you down a bit, Rest if you must, but don't you quit. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when you're hardest hit. It's when things seem worse that you must not quit. Paul, he, uh, when he was Saul, he sought to destroy Christianity. He hated the Lord Jesus Christ. After he got saved, he spent the rest of his life serving the Lord and went through a lot of hardship to do it. In Galatians 1.23, the Word of God says, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which he once which once he destroyed. His life changed when 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 Christ came in, his life changed. And when he was in jail, he didn't quit. When he was floating around in the Mediterranean Sea, he didn't quit. And when everything was upside down and and we, we read a menu of things in the Bible that, that Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, allowed him to list these things. Here's what I've gone through. But also the Holy Spirit was able to use him to tell us that 
that all those things are going to amount to nothing when they're compared, just paraphrasing, when they're compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. You see, this life is very short. If you live to be a hundred, that was a short life compared to eternity. So it's easier to quit serving the Lord than to keep serving. Number two, it's easier to tear down than to build up. It's easier to destroy a home and a marriage and a family than it is to build up that home and that marriage and that family. Proverbs 14.1, the Bible tells us, Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. And this applies both to husbands and wives. We, we don't have to use a wrecking bar to destroy our family, our marriage, our home. We do it with our tongue. In James 3.8, the Bible says, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Ephesians 4.29 reminds us, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Grace. Something that wasn't even deserved. But it's easier to tear down than it is to build up. It's easier to tear down a church than it is to build one. And how does a church get torn down? Through unfaithfulness. Unfaithfulness in attendance. Unfaithfulness in participation. I've shared this before in the pulpit. I've followed up on folks that that are looking for a church. Over the years. And I ask the question sometimes when I'm in those situations. Well, tell me, why why'd you leave the church you were in? And sadly, I've heard things like, well, you know, Pastor Randall, our, our, our pastor stopped having an altar call. said, oh, and you responded to the altar call, right? Well, our pastor, he discontinued having the midweek service. Really? And you were faithful to the midweek service, correct? Well, he stopped having the Sunday evening service. And you were there too, right? And sometimes it's because a pastor has lost his way. And then sometimes it's just, he's discouraged because he preaches his heart out and nobody goes to the altar. He shows up on Wednesday and there's hardly anybody beyond his own family there. He shows up on Sunday night and it's virtually the same thing. And we think pastors are beyond discouragement. They can never get discouraged. Why? They're super Christian. They don't bleed. My heart goes out to some of these guys. And by the way, the reason why there is a dearth in pastors is because some of them... Listen, I've talked to preachers over the years who did not look forward to coming to church in their church. And you're only going to do that for so long before you finally just hang it up. How do we tear down a church? Well, there's gossip, there's slander, 
There's indifference. There's apathy. You know, I, I, I want to I want to be part of the construction crew. Not the destruction crew. Amen? But it's, it's, it's easier to tear down than it is to build up. And number three, it's easier to sit down than it is to stand up. True. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, and talking about the whole armor of God, it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. The very next verse, verse 14, the very next word is stand therefore. Next phrase. We need to stand up for the Lord. We need to, we need to understand that if we don't, who's going to? Luke chapter 22, verse 55, And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. He had no business being there. He had no business sitting down with them. He sat down with them to keep from being identified as one of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was the same one who just earlier said, you know, Lord, I'll follow you to death. <laughs> Talk is cheap, isn't it? It's cheap. But, you know, how many Christians find it's easy to live for the Lord within the four walls of the church, but it's a real test once I walk outside the building. How many even know you're a Christian? Real believers need to stand up. Are you with me tonight still? We need to let the world know that we're not ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul said that in Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We need to stand up. I'm not ashamed to be a Christian. I'm not ashamed to preach this old book. I don't care. Listen, I don't care what, I, well, I shouldn't say I don't care. It bothers me to see what's happening. But, but listen, though others may fall for some other philosophy and some other, uh, you know, some other uh, thing, change Bibles, change music, change standards, That's not the answer. And I'm not going down that road. We need to stand up and get involved. In Ezekiel 22.30 And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land. We could take land, couldn't we? And we could put America that I should not destroy it, but I found none. God said, I found none. I searched the entire human race of, and, and, and the, entire, the entire population of those who said, you're Lord. But he said, I didn't find anybody to stand in the gap. I didn't, I didn't find anybody that would stand up. In every church, there's a gap. Every church. In every church, there's a place of service that needs to be filled. In every single church, that's, that's, the, that's the reality. In most churches, by the way, there are several gaps. And we find that there are people that are doing 
three and four things or more even. Whilst there are others who are doing nothing. Who will stand up and say, you can count on me? David stood up to fight Goliath. When, and, and by the way, the entire army of Israel was happy to let him do it. Whilst they, whilst they stood off to the side and shivered. Do you see how big he is? And David said, you know how big my God is? Every day we're faced with choices. Demas will always be remembered for eternity as the man who quit on God. Now, Demas served earlier. I mean, there's, hey, listen, there's, there's all the, there, there's all the, the, the possibility in the world that Demas was truly born again. Somewhere along the line, maybe he got discouraged. Somewhere along the line, maybe he got fearful. How many Christians quit their churches because they were fearful over COVID? Went through all of the period of time of prevention. Well, we're beyond this now. But Sadly, got used to being out of church. They quit assembling themselves together. You know, if there's real physical reason, real health reason, why a person can't do that, I fully understand. Um, Listen, in the Randall home, we live that every day. I understand. What I don't understand is when we quit doing what we should do for the most frivolous of reasons. Philippians 4.13 tells us, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Beloved, it's easy to quit, but it's not the right path. It's not the right thing to do. It never has been and it never ever will be. And so I I challenge all of us this evening. Times are not going to get, I don't think, they're not going to get easier. We're marching toward the end. How far away are we? I have no idea. Could be tonight, could be a hundred years from now. But this much I do know is that we're closer today than we were yesterday. And so the pressure is going to be on. Satan is going to turn up the heat, so to speak. He's going to cause issues and problems. We need to keep our eyes on the Lord. We need to keep our eyes on the Lord. And that's the only way that we're going to find that we won't quit. Don't you want to hear these words? Well done. Thou good and, say it, faithful servant. You know, the Lord is going to reward the faithful, but not everybody's faithful. And so it isn't going to be, well, I just get to see hear those words. <laughs> well, you do if you're faithful. And the faithful They don't quit. Are you on board? Amen? Father in heaven, I thank you tonight and I pray.